All right, guys. So today we're continuing our building a product catalog. Uh, today's topic, we're going to basically connect everything we've done so far with the catalog. We're going to now use web services to remotely interact with our catalog. So what have we covered so far? So, so far we've gone over the use case of a product catalog. Uh, what is basically the defining the particular parts of a product catalog? Uh, looking at the different data types that we can uh, store data in, be it uh, CSS, uh, CBS files, flat files, uh, DBF files, database files, spreadsheets, so forth. Uh, we've also looked at building different types of applications to connect to our product catalog. We have the straight up standalone uh, desktop application. We've created a web model view controller application. We've also created a WordPress plugin to put a product catalog into our WordPress site. And we've also looked at building a mobile application and putting a product catalog into a mobile app. Following all those, we've also talked about some testing using Selenium to actually test our different applications. So today, though, we are going to cover what are web services, the different types of web services there are. We're going to then build a RESTful web service. And then we're going to update our mobile app to call our web service. And the last thing, which really isn't on here, but uh, if we have time, I'm actually going to go back and start up our old MVC application. So we'll have our model view controller. We'll have our web interface to our product catalog. We will have our mobile app that we will also connect to our web services. And I'll actually show you uh, the demo today. We're actually going to build a RESTful web service application that's going to communicate with our database that is within the MVC application. So what are web services? Well, the base definition, web services are self-contained, modular, distributive, dynamic applications that can be described, published, located, or invoked over the network to create products, processes, and supply chains. These applications can be local, distributed, or web-based applications. Web services are built on top of open standards, such as TCP IP, HTTP, Java, HTML, and XML. In a nutshell, web services are essentially applications behind the scenes on the back end, in the cloud, microservices, etc., that we can communicate to distribute information back and forth without having to build GUIs or any major complex front end applications to talk to our data. So why use web services? Well, we can use it for exposing the existing function on a network, interoperability, standardized protocols, and low-cost communications. Let's dive into those a little bit further. So the first one, exposing the existing function on a network. So a web service is a unit of managed code that can be remotely invoked using HTTP. That is, it can be activated using HTTP requests. Web services allows you to expose the functionality of your existing code over the network. Once it's exposed on the network, other applications can use the functionality of your program. Interoperability, our web services allow various applications to talk to each other and share data and services among themselves. Other applications can also use the web services. For example, a VB or .NET application can talk to Java web services and vice versa. Web services are used to make application platform and technologies independent. Standardized protocol, Web services use standardized industry standard protocols for the communication. All the four layers, uh, we have the service transport, XML, messaging, uh, service descriptions, and service discovery layers, define protocols, and web service protocol stack. This standardization of protocol stack gives businesses many advantages, such as wide ranges of choices, reduction in the cost due to competition and increase in quality, low-cost communications. Well, web services use SOAP over HTTP protocols, so you can use your existing low-cost internet for implementing web services. This solution is much less costly compared to proprietary solutions like electronic data interchange, or EDI, or business-to-business -business B2B protocols. Uh, besides SOAP over HTTP, web services can also be implemented on other reliable transfer mechanisms like FTP or REST. So what types of web services do we have? Well, we have REST, which REST stands for Representation State Transfer and is well-suited for basic ad hoc integration scenarios. 
RESTful web services are often best integrated with HTTP, other than SOAP-based services. Uh, SOAP-based services do not require XML messaging or WSDL service API definitions. Simply put, REST takes a resource-based approach to web-based interactions. You locate a resource on a server, and you choose to either update that resource, delete it, or get some information about it. This is what we will be looking at today. Next, we have SOAP. SOAP stands for Simple Object Access Protocol and is an XML-based protocol for accessing web services. SOAP is based on XML and is a W3C recommendation. Unlike REST, however, with SOAP, the client doesn't choose to interact directly with the resource, but instead calls a service, and that service mitigates access to various objects and resources behind the scenes. SOAP has also built a large number of frameworks and APIs on top of HTTP, including the Web Service Description Layer, WSDL, or WSDL, which defines the structure of the data and gets, that gets passed back and forth between the client and server. So next, we have WSDL. WSDL stands for, again, the Web Service Definition Language. It is also an XML-based language for describing web services. It, too, is a W3C recommendation. And as mentioned before, it's also used to define structures of data that gets passed back and forth between client and server. Next, we have RDF. RDF stands for Resource Description Framework and is a framework for describing resources on the web. It is written in XML and is also a W3C recommendation. Using RDF means the data in your system is intrinsically reusable, even by applications which know nothing about your specific data model, especially since they can still process the data and extract information from it. Also using RDF means you don't tie yourself to a proprietary application specific format or to a specific XML schema. And you can easily extend your data model or add annotations which are ignored by main applications as you see fit. Finally, we have RSS. RSS stands for really simple syndication and allows you to syndicate your site content. It does this by defining an easy way to share and view headlines and content. Files can be automatically updated, and RSS allows personalized views for different sites. It, too, is written in XML, and one of the most common uses of RSS is news feeds, which for those of us that have gone through launching an internet business, if you have a WordPress site, you can actually turn all your posts into uh, an RSS news feed that can be integrated to any RSS readable apps. So building a RESTful web services. This is what we're going to do today. So what do we need to begin? Well, we need a MySQL database so that we have a database to store our product catalog information. We built this way back, I think, in episode two or three. Spring, uh, we are continuing to use the Spring framework for our applications. Uh, we're going to use a combination of Spring data, Spring MVC to communicate back and forth with our data. We're also going to do all this with Java 8 and Maven. The mobile piece of this, we're going to continue to use App Accelerator from our previous presentations. But what are we going to build? Well, today we're going to build some product functionality in a RESTful web service that is going to give us the ability to add, edit, delete, and fetch all products. We're also going to include a find by ID and find by name. And then we're going to duplicate this functionality for vendor. So let's me jump out to the demo. So we're going to jump into Spring. I use a Spring tool suite for my development. And to begin with, uh, we'll quickly recap. So back in episode four, we did the MVC application. Our MVC product was connecting to a MySQL database, which I'm running MAMP, which has my MySQL database loaded. And in here, we created a very simple front end uh, application for the web, which allows us to go in, look at the products we have in our database, and essentially edit them, delete them, add new products, and so on. So, new product. As you can see, I have a couple little pieces that aren't connected right now. But as you can see, here's the list. So, we can jump back, go to vendor, and here's our vendor. So, go back. So, that was the MVC portion of this. So now essentially what we're going to do is we're going to create a RESTful web service that is going to simulate these functionalities. We're going to have the ability to add a new product, edit existing products, delete products, and view all or specific 
products that are already in our catalog. So for that, the first thing you can do is you can do new spring starter project, make your life easy. Oh, project name, rest demo, rest, all that looks good. Next, and then we're going to do MySQL. Uh, I'm going to do rest repositories. And if you wanted to actually uh, build in some rest docs, you can use the rest docs, but that's outside of this scope. So we'll just take those two. Next, that's fine, finish. So now it essentially gives you the basics for everything you need to get started. So now you have a REST demo application, now you can run your resource, application properties, and your test. Very simple, very empty, but we're gonna fill things in. So instead of just jumping into this, I've already done this, and we have our product catalog two here, which is our REST, uh, our RESTful web service. So in here, we have our application Java. This is essentially the Spring Boot configuration that will kick off our Tomcat server running our RESTful application, which you can see down here in our boot dashboard. We have product two running on port 8080, and our MVC application is currently running on port 8090. 8081. So we have our applications and we have a few settings in our application properties file. So the other thing it here is we define our spring main banner off. If we left that on, that's okay. All that does is when you start your spring boot, it removes the spring header that's basically at the top of your log files, which shrinks your log files down by a couple of lines. Initially I was using I just, oh, that was the one I forgot to add. So the other one to add to your project when you build is uh, JPA Hibernate. So we're gonna create that. This is gonna allow us to quickly model uh, our tables into our little REST project here. Uh, we're gonna also put our MySQL configuration settings in here. So here's our URL to connect to MySQL and our default test user ID and password. And test resource, this just contains all the URLs that we're going to essentially build. All right, so the first thing we need to do is we need to create our models. So these are gonna tie, these are basically data objects that tie to our database tables. So I created these as entity to tie them to Hibernate, set ID, generic values. So this is gonna be the unique ID of our table, product ID, category ID, name, summary, these are all the pre-existing table IDs we built previously, and all of our getters and setters. I also always add a two string. This helps for debugging. Uh, you can customize this. What's nice about Eclipse is you can right click, go to source, and you can just quickly build this on any, play, uh, any uh, class that you have. So you can create a two string, Yes, and then you can pick and choose what you want in your two string. So if you want to debug everything, you can select everything. Tell it where to put it. We'll just drop it at the end of the file. You can also generate method comments. Click OK, and there it is. It's all in here. I'll undo that for now. Keep it simple. So we got product, and we have vendor. So again, vendor, we've set it as an entity to tie it to hibernate. We have our, our ID generated values so that we auto generate our vendor IDs if one does not exist, and all our getters and setters in our two string. Next, we need to set up our communications with the repositories. So we have our product repository. Nice little feature about Spring Boots, the JPA with Spring Data, is they have this class called CRUD Repository. 
So you no longer have to create your instance methods for create, update, delete, and insert into your database. Just by extending the CRUD repository, you already have all this, including find one and a couple other pre-existing CRUD repository. Here we go. So you got save, find one, does it exist, find all, find all iterable, how many are in there, delete by ID, delete all, and delete iterable. So basically, it, it cuts down on having to create a lot of the boilerplate code. And then all you have to do here is add in the additional functionality you want to add to your database. So I have added a find by name, so we can look up by a product name, find by price, we can look up by a price. And I have a unique query here where I can look up find by name containing. So this is my like. So if I wanted to do a search, it's kind of a wildcard search. This would kind of be like your Google search. You can just start typing and it will just start pulling in a like. It'll pull whatever matches from beginning and at the end based on what you're typing. And that all these return list of products. Vendor, we haven't added any additional implementations here yet. Uh, I did mostly product for the initial start of this. We'll add some to vendor as we go along. And we have our controllers. So just like the model view controller, we have to have our controllers so we know what to pass in from the URL. So we start out, we define our annotation for REST controller. So it's essentially stating that this is for REST communications. Uh, we can do request mappings here for product. So what this defines here is that this class all the API calls in this class at the URL have to start with product. So in our controller, so in order to access any of these mappings that we have in here, our getters and deletes and posts, uh, we have to prefix our call with product. So if I want to see all products, I do product all and fetch, and it returns me a JSON string of all the products that are in my database. I define a product repository so I can communicate with my database. So that's how this communicates back to the database. And because I have the model set up as an entity, it's going to look for a table that matches product in the database. So again, you cut down on a lot of boilerplate code using uh, the spring data. All right, so the first one we're going to look at is this guy down here. So we just saw what he returned. He returns all the products. So what are we doing here? Well, first we're saying we're going to get, so this is going to be a get request. It's going to be a get mapping. The path or the URI is going to contain product all. Why is it product all? Well, product is defined up here at this level. So at the class level, you have to start with product and then all. And then what this does, it's going to return a JSON raw value. It's going to be an iterable list of products, and it's called get products. So we call our product repository find all. Which, firstly, you don't see it defined here. That's because it's part of the CRUD repository. So some other things you can find. So you got find all, find all interval, find my name. Uh, we define that. Here's the deletes, deletes and notifies. So do find all. And when we run it, we get a nice JSON view of all of our products. Well, how do we know that's all of our products? Well, let's go look at this guy again. Here's our product. So we have product ID 9, 10, 18, 19. We have Dr. Two shirts, test products, Tom Baker scarf, sonic screwdriver. Let's go over here. We have product ID 9, uh, 10's in here somewhere. There it is. There's 10, 19. So the, this is our product list. So we know we've connected that far. All right. So now let's add a product. So here we pass in another get request. So at the uh, basically that means get allows you to just type everything in the URL. Uh, if you do a post, you have to basically do it from a form post or using a post header 
or you can use a tool like Postman where you can actually define what your protocol is going to be. All right, so our mapping is going to be a get. I'm going to add. So this maps only get requests. Uh, it's going to return JSON raw values. It's going to return a product. We're going to add a new product. And we're going to pull the category ID, name, summary, description, price, and quantity from the corresponding URL. So URL would ha is going to look something like this. So HTTP, localhost, 8080, product, add, question mark. Category ID equals category ID and name. So essentially all your name, our uh, key value pairs get passed in in the URL. So we'll copy that. And we'll drop that in here. And we've just added a product. And we know it's a product now because we have a new product ID. So product ID 20. If we go look over here, we had no 20. If we refresh this guy, we now have product 20. So, so far things are working smoothly. So we have add. So let's do find by name. This particular find by name um, is going to be the name containing. So the name containing, if we go back over to our repository, name containing, this is our wildcard search. So whatever we type in, it's going to look for whatever is like what we're looking for. So for that, so this returns me the products that have Sonic in them. So we know that that's working. And what's cool here is if you put squiggly name or squiggly whatever your ID is going to be, that's going to be your variable name, but it's going to pull the value straight from the URL. So you don't have to do the key value pairing anymore. You can just do find whatever the key is, and they can type in the value after the slash. Uh, you could also define it uh, the other way where you can actually force them to actually have to type in name equals and the path. Similar to like how we did the add. But here, so we also have find by ID. So find by ID. Do 10. There we go. ID 10. So here we're doing a find by one. So we're looking for one record, not many. And again, that we then change our format to just return product, not a list. We have delete, so we can actually delete that new guy we added. So delete 20. But there's a catch to delete. It's not going to work as a get request. I've set it up as a delete mapping. So you have to actually pass in a delete method. So we go over here to Postman. And I change my method to be a delete. Now that guy worked. Right now I'm not having it return anything. If we look in here, so uh, system.out fetching and deleting with user ID right here. So we're fetching and deleting with ID 20. We do a lookup to see if it already exists. If it does exist, great, we go ahead and delete it. If it doesn't exist, we throw a message unable to delete and we'll throw not found. So if I change that back now that we've already deleted it, if I do that again, apparently I didn't throw the message, but we did get the message here, unable to delete. So I'm just not posting back to the system. So here, unable to delete, user ID 20. So we got find by name, search by ID, delete by ID. And here we are. This name here is by a specific name. So the name has to actually match. So now if I do product name Sonic, that won't work. Returns nothing. However, refresh the sky. If I do test product, it returns our product. And we did the all. So that's the repository piece of this in a nutshell. 
Now, you see that we can use this from the URLs. We can call it from Postman, but we want to make it a little more useful. We want to actually call it from our mobile application. So we'll go over here and we'll start up our mobile app. So previously, our mobile app had a container. We were pointing from a in-memory database on our mobile app, and we were loading that database directly into the table. Well, now we're pulling directly from our database online. So I've already made the changes here. Let's just verify that. So we have product repository. So we have four items, Doctor Who t-shirt, test product, Tom Baker, Sonic screwdriver. So now let's go back over here. So the changes we needed to make was, first of all, we needed to drop the table rows from our table view. So we're not predefining it. We're not mapping it anymore like we were doing previously. So as you can see, I've commented out the two lines we didn't need anymore. And the one thing I did not comment out was this guy, but this guy needs to come in too. So if we compare those side by side, we have our navigation window, our window, which has container and products, uh, our table view, we have moved our on-click event up to the table. That will now apply it to all the rows that are defined in our table. And we have our toolbar where we can also add our products. So now the other change we made here, we index is still the same. We have added a row though. So we've moved our row logic into its own alloy component. This is kind of cool. You can plug and play and create your own individual components that can be reused across screens. So we have our row, which just is going to define our label here. Our row style, it's going to be horizontal. It's going to be font 24 and height of 40. And we're going to make it basically fit the full width of our, our row. Our index, that didn't change. Uh, our row JavaScript, all the row JavaScript is doing is it's mapping our product information into the label. So we can pull that information out when we actually click on it. So like Doctor Who t-shirts, default name, default name, summary. Uh, let's see, Sonic Screwdriver, default name, Sonic Screwdriver, David Tennant, makes lots of noise. So we can still pull the information from these, and I'll show you that in just a second. Our index, our JavaScript for our index has changed. So if we pull up the previous one, this guy here, uh, side by side. So previously, we had collections, everything from here down did not exist. So this is all we had previously. So we had show products. So when you click, it displayed the products. If we flip the switch, uh, when you click this, it would go to edit products and we could edit and save our changes. Add products, you can click down here to add a new product. Now we've changed this though to include some new functionality. So here's our original functionality. I've removed the collection from memory, so we're not loading the database, the internal device database that we've created at this time. We've still kept the show products, add and edit. We've added some additional details. So now we're gonna create a, an array to hold our information that we pull from our asynchronous AJAX request. We're gonna create a variable called, uh, or an object called send it that is going to be a create HTTP client connection. On error, we're going to create an internal function. If we get an error, we're going to say there was an error during communication and timeout. So this guy here is going to be used to open our connection to make our JSON calls. Send it open. This is going to tell us what website we want to hit. And then send it send calls this uh, URL here, and then you call sendit.onload to pull in the information after you get the response back from send. So onload function, products, JSON parse. So what did we get back when we called send? It's stored here. 
If the length is zero, we basically throw a message in here saying that the database row is empty. If there is information, oh, before we check for information, we want to set this list here to be empty. Uh, right now, I don't have a re reload functionality built into this, just a load. But if we had a reload, this would be necessary so that we don't duplicate this list every time we come back to the screen. Next, we loop through our products. So if we have more than one products, which we do here, we have four. We then go through and we create a data. So we create our array up here. So we're now storing into our array. Data.push, we're creating a new row. Our new row is going to be this guy here, the row XML. And we're going to pass in the ID, name, summary, and description, which then get mapped in the row JavaScript. So when the row XML gets added, it applies the row JavaScript. And summary description. And then we call get view, which then ties this into the, the data view. So the data view get view. So now it basically creates this as a view. And now that it's a view, when we say data, or we use data, it treats it as a view. So this whole thing here is a view that's been added to our table view. So our product table dot set data, data, we've now added our rows inside of our table view. It's kind of a dynamic way of adding things to your table. And then index that opens, opens up our screen here. So to see this breakpoint here, can run as debug. And we'll run through it. All right, so the first breakpoint I had is in the row.js. So it's actually stepping in here and populating the data. Just let that run. It doesn't break on ours. But it did run. So down here, where I had this TI API product I, it actually printed out the information we received in our JSON. So here's our ca uh, category zero, product ID nine, product ID 10, 18, 19. And what it did over here is it stored that information into these views. Just so you can see that it's not hard coded, if we go over here to product detail, uh, when it loads, it's mapping the data that is in this view, and then it's uh, pulling those args in, remapping them, and then assigning them to the corresponding views in product detail. So we have our label, our, our ID label, name label, summary, and description. So we have default name, sonic screwdriver, David Tennant screwdriver, make lots of noise. And then the last thing I did, so I tried to get delete product done before presentation here. It deleted it. However, it doesn't refresh the list. But if we go out here and we refresh our list here, oh, found. Oh, failed to bind request it. It lost the ID. Uh, apparently, I didn't get the did delete. May not have been pulling the args incorrectly. But we do know that delete works because if we do delete. Oops, doesn't delete. Remember, we have to do it as a delete method. Go. Product. It's gone. And again, if we do all, it's not there. So let's recap. So we talked about 
what web services are. And we talked about the different types of web services, uh, the REST, so um, WSDLs, RSS, RDF, and, and such. And then we also took the time and we built out a fully functional uh, RESTful web service for adding products to our product catalog. And then we also updated our mobile app to actually use the web services. So what are we going to talk about next? Well, in uh, the next few lessons, we're going to wrap up our WordPress plugin techniques. Uh, I've pulled that out of this lesson because I've decided I'm actually going to show you how to do the different types of templates where you can load the products into your pages, posts, uh, and so forth. But you can also use not only the WordPress database, but you can also use your plugins to communicate with your web services. So we're actually going to do two parts. We're going to talk about how to apply the uh, WordPress themes to your layouts, to do short codes and embed your products into your pages and such. And then we're also going to switch and flip the switch. And instead of doing it locally, we're going to look at doing it through the web services. And then finally, we're going to look at reporting. And there again, we're going to do reporting two different ways. We're going to do it directly off the server. And then we're also going to do reporting via uh, web services calls. Thanks again for your time. If you have any questions, comments, or requests, please drop a line on this blog, in Vimeo, uh, wherever you find this video, or shoot us an email at info at developerner.com. Thank you. Have a great day. Anyone have questions? Um, yeah, I do have one, but mine uh, is kind of probably non-related, but I know you talked about Selenium. Is Selenium going to die since it doesn't test the new Mozilla, the newest? The Selenium IDE probably is. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Selenium itself, as far as the web drivers and things like that, behind the scenes, I think that's still going to be there or something will, like it will come out of the community. Selenium itself is still being supported. The IDE and the Selenium Builder for Sauce Lab have four or five people working on that, and they weren't getting paid. It was just something they were doing for their jobs and for their time, and they have since moved on to other things. And they have both said on the community and out in the open source, hey, if other people want to uh, contribute to this, go for it. Otherwise. It is what it is. You can roll back to Firefox 4.8 uh, or 48, and you can still use the IDE there. But, you know, we'll have to see what the community comes up with next. Yeah, okay. So is there another free tool that probably you can think of that uh, might, be, might replace Selenium? Well, that's what I mean. Selenium itself, mm -hmm. I don't think that's going anywhere. But all the IDE and all the GUI tools that pre-exist for it, they're going away right now until someone else comes up with something else. Now, with that also being said, uh, Sauce Labs is cooking up some other things. They just haven't quite open sourced it yet. Supposedly, Firefox has some new things that are coming out. They haven't completed that yet. Chrome has things that you can use, the different plugins. But... There again, there's a lot of changes going on within the browsers right now. We're not really going to see the dust settle till the end of Q1, maybe even Q2, because Chrome is saying that they're turning off the App Store, which doesn't necessarily tell us what they're going to do with their apps and extensions and things like that, if they're all going to work uh, right now on my Mac, which is kind of interesting. So I had to look for Postman, and Postman, he actually shows up as an app. And he it used to be an extension inside of Chrome, but now it, it drops out as an app all by himself. So I have to actually open him up, and then he opens up inside of the browser. So it's kind of like the uh, Selenium servers that you have to start up now to actually communicate with the browsers to run your Selenium tests. Uh, so, like I said, until we know what they're going to do, uh, it's going to be interesting to just kind of do a wait and see before you get too far away from Selenium. Stick with Selenium for now. I don't see it going away anytime soon. It, it just may evolve into something else. Oh, thanks. Hey, Michael, I was going to ask about your entity, particularly um, you only define the... Uh, uh, the ID is an auto-generated field. Do you have to, um, I don't know if this is just an older version of Spring Data JPA, 
But do you have to define each column that those entities map to, or is that something that Hibernate take, takes care of? So that's a, a good question. But by defining it as an entity here mm -hmm. and doing ID here uh, with the Spring J, uh, I'm using the Spring Data piece. So once you tie it to the product repository and you extend the CRUD repository, it mm -hmm. handles all that for you. Okay. Okay. You just have to make sure you define all your columns that are in the database in the DAL. Or I got in the you. data object. It, yeah, it's actually I'm very a, slick how they did all this. They cut out ninety percent of the boilerplate. Yeah, I've uh, actually set up a couple of projects now with that. I don't know why I thought I had to define every single one, but I'm glad to know that I don't have to now because <laughs> I was typing out. Well, actually, I automated it, but I was having to type out all of that. So. Uh, yeah, so all this is good. communicating directly with the database. So if I actually yeah. go out to my database here. So yeah, all the requests I was making, nothing other than the ID for the generate it was being mapped. And you kind of have yeah. to do that just so it knows what the unique ID or if you don't define this, it will mm -hmm. automatically add an ID field. I see, I see. Which mm -hmm. In my case, I define mine as product ID in my table. So it, mm -hmm. you got to be careful with that. But in the same token, I mean, not everyone's going to name every field, you know, product ID. They're going to name them the way they want to name them, yeah. which isn't always best practice. But we are, <laughs> so, so we got so product. So let me edit the product here. So we got select star from Dr. Catalog. So we have ID, category ID, title. This might be the old one. Ah, uh, here we are, product catalog. Yep, sorry. I've had a couple different projects going. So product catalog, here we are. So product, our columns are product ID, category name, mm -hmm. summary, description, price, and quantity. Let's see. Um, and in the case where you don't use best practices with your naming conventions, you would have to explicitly define those column mappings, correct? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. That might be what I saw going on. Okay. I there, there was quite a few little tutorials. If you really just want to get started, the, the coolest way to refresh my memory on Spring Data and JPA and all that, I just did mm -hmm. new import. Spring Getter starter content. Mm -hmm. It takes a minute. It's not the fastest thing in the world. <laughs> oh, it's, there we go. And then you can get starter packages. So you can do data AP, uh, data JPA. You mm -hmm. can do data rest. And you just select that guy and you do finish. It gives you the init so you can walk through it. Yep. Or you can just jump to the completed version, see what they did. So there's their customer ID. And there's their customer repository. Nice, nice. Um, I had another question concerning the front end. Do you know if someone's already put together some slick uh, front end that will tie into this JPA? Fred repository because I've uh, again worked with it before, but you know, just having to build out you know any pages regarding that aside from just a simple page, I'd love to see someone actually you know do something really nice and slick with some responsive stuff uh, to make those um, those uh, CRUD front end pages look pretty nice, but you know, simple as well. These aren't bad. It's a spring web content example. So mm -hmm. you got your greetings controller. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Source. Bear with me. I got to remember where they hide some of this stuff. Here we are. You got your index. And right here, this is pretty simple vanilla stuff, but yeah. I mean, it's not that bad. However, not so much with Eclipse. Uh, do I still have it installed? I do not. 
but NetBeans and JDeveloper have something. Um, uh, I have to go back through my Java One notes, but I think there's even one for Spring. But you can mm-hmm. basically run their boilerplate, kind of like these, and it will tie. Uh, you have to basically map your database, and you can yeah. do it kind of how we did it here, just with the data objects and the repository. Or you can go through its little tool mapper, and it will mm-hmm. basically build you an AJAX front end tied uh, MVC that ties directly to your app, uh, your database. Very clean, very slick. Uh, I'll, I'll have to look that up. I'll get uh, that'll be my nugget for next week. I'll find that and drop that out there. Uh, but yeah, it, it's slick. It, yeah, exactly yeah. what you're asking for. It will do that. Nice, nice. 